6.2 the natural logarithm okay before we develop the idea of the natural logarithm uh, let's think back to college algebra and recall how you developed the idea of the natural logarithm in that class in that class you probably started out by defining the exponential function so you looked at something like a to the x where the base a was a positive number but not 1. And so you probably talked about exponential functions like 2 to the x, 1 half to the x. Later on, you determined the number e, which was about 2.718, and you even had the exponential function base e. You figured out that exponential functions came in two basic flavors, exponential growth, and exponential decay and it all depended on whether the base was bigger than one or whether the base was less than one okay once you figured all of that out uh, you realize that either one of these two functions you were talking about were both one to one and since they're one to one they have inverses so at that point in college algebra you would have defined log base a of x to be the inverse of a to the x. And so again, if the exponential function was defined to be a to the x, the inverse function in that class was defined to be the thing we call the logarithm. And of course, what was ln of x? It was simply the log base e. So that means e to the x and ln of x were inverses. Okay, now in a nutshell, that's what you talked about in college algebra. And that worked just fine for what you were doing in that class. Of course, there are some holes there. One of the biggest ones is going back to how you even evaluate this so-called exponential function. If I ask you something like, 2 squared or 2 cubed or 2 to the fifth, it's easy enough to understand what those mean. When I raise a base like 2 to a positive integer power like 2 or 3 or 5, it means I simply take 2 copies of 2 or 3 copies of 2 or 5 copies of 2 and multiply them. So what we're saying is, in this case, this positive integer exponent just tells me how many factors of 2 are being multiplied together. If I switch to negative integer powers, like 2 to the negative 1, 2 to the negative 3, 2 to the negative 5, well, I know something like 2 to the negative 3 is simply 2 cubed to the negative 1 by definition. We even know how to do things like 2 to the 1 half or 2 to the 3 fifths. We understand that rational exponents imply certain kinds of radicals. So 2 to the 1 half is square root of 2. 2 to the 3 fifths is the fifth root of 2 cubed, or the fifth root of 8. So the thing we sort of skirt in college algebra, of course, is what does it mean to take 2 and raise it to something like the square root of 3, or 2 to the pi? Notice now that exponent is not a positive integer or a negative integer or a rational number, uh, which means at this point, unless you've already done this before, you might be hard-pressed to give me a very well-defined idea or a good definition of what it means to raise 2 to the irrational number square root of 3. Okay, we'll come up with a definition for that in the next section. But this exposes one of the holes in developing the idea of exponential functions of logarithmic functions in college algebra, which is we don't really define what it means to raise a base in an exponential function to an irrational number. So in this class, we're going to come at things in a very different way. Instead of starting out with the exponential function, and then defining the log function as its inverse, we're going to do that in reverse. And we're going to do it 
in sort of uh, what will seemingly be an unusual way at first. So let's start right off with the sort of the foundational definition for the next four sections. It's the definition that everything else is built from. Let's define the natural log of x to be the integral 1 to x 1 over t dt where x is restricted to be greater than 0. Uh, notice with this definition I am defining the domain of this function with this definition and I am defining it to be 0 to infinity. Let's think about a few easy characteristics of the log function and of course uh, if we think about the log function its graph that we're familiar with the natural log uh, even though theoretically we don't know what that is yet since we're building this function we do know from college algebra that's what the graph should look like so keep that graph in mind as we work through building this function in this new way now, be, before I do that, uh, let's quickly take a look at the function 1 over x, which is what you see on the screen now. And so actually, rather than think of this as the x-axis and the y-axis, let's think of this as the t-axis and the y-axis. And so if I asked you, what is the ln of 2 according to this definition? Well, according to this definition, the ln of 2 would be the integral 1 to 2, 1 over t dt. And in this picture, that means we'd be looking at the area under the graph of 1 over t from t equals 1 to t equals 2. Okay, and that would look like, of course, this. So what you're looking at in this picture, that area, is ln of 2. So be clear here, we are defining the natural log function as an accumulated area function. Like those accumulated area functions we talked about in Calc 1 when we were looking at the fundamental theorem of calculus. If I asked you what the ln of 4 was, it would be the integral from 1 to 4, 1 over t dt. Now, think about what the ln of one-half would be. The ln of one-half, according to our definition, would be the integral from one to one-half, one over t dt. Notice that since my upper limit is smaller than my lower limit in that integral, to get that into something more recognizable or easy to understand, I would probably want to exchange those limits and recall that when we do that it negates the value of the integral. Notice in our picture that if I shaded in this green area that would be the integral one half to one one over t dt, but if I negated that I would actually get one of those so-called negative areas. And that's consistent with what I'm seeing in this definition. The ln of 1 half is definitely a negative number. And again, if I think about the graph we have in mind for the natural log function, if this is x equals 1, it does look like that any x value larger than 1, the ln of x will be positive. Whereas for any x values less than 1, for instance x equals 1 half, the ln of x will be negative. Of course, what's the most important piece in that entire picture? The ln of 1, again, by our new definition, 
will be the integral from 1 to 1, 1 over t dt, which is 0, which definitely establishes that x equals 1 is the x-intercept of this ln of x graph. Okay, before we go any further, uh, let's review something else we talked about in college algebra and look at it from a slightly different perspective. Let's think about the three basic properties of the natural log that we talked about in college algebra. Suppose a and b are positive real numbers. And suppose r is a rational number. Then, of course, we have our familiar looking properties. ln of a times b is ln a plus ln b. You may have called this the product rule. ln of a divided by b was ln a minus ln b. You may have called that the quotient rule. And then number three, the ln of a to the r, that is the ln of something raised to a power, was the same thing as r times the ln of a. So the exponent in that argument of the log function can be pulled out in front of the log function and it becomes a multiplier. You may have called this the power rule. Okay, let's look at the proof of just one of these because the concept or the idea behind the proof is something you need to know. In fact, I'd ask you to try and prove the other two in the same way I'm going to prove number one. Um, so let's let f of x equal the ln of ax. Now, now before we go any further than this, Let's just make a little aside here. Can we say what the derivative of the natural log is? Let's see, remember our definition now is that the natural log of x is the integral from 1 to x, 1 over t dt. Okay, we remember from Calc 1, the fundamental theorem of calculus, says that if we take the derivative with respect to a variable x of an accumulation function that goes from, let's say, a constant of c to x, f of t dt, if you recall, the first fundamental theorem of calculus simply says that the answer for that will be f of x. In other words, our derivative is simply this integrand function with x replacing the t. Okay, if that's the case, what's the derivative with respect to x of the integral 1 to x, 1 over t dt? It should just be 1 over x, where I just replace that t by an x. Okay, we'll come back to this in a minute, but we have just uh, along the way here established our first big important derivative rule, which is the derivative of ln of x is 1 over x. Okay, we should also be able to write a chain rule for that, or a chain rule version of that. What if I was taking the derivative with respect to x of ln of u, where u was some function of x? Well, it should be 1 over u. That would be the derivative of the outer function, which is the log function, and I leave the argument or the inside of that function alone, 
but then the chain rule says I should multiply times the derivative of that inside part or that argument. In other words, the derivative of ln of u should be u prime over u. All right, now we've actually established here two big rules, our major derivative rules for the logarithm. But now let's go back to where we were in this proof. We started by letting f of x equals ln of x, ln of ax. So if f of x <coughs> excuse me, is equal to ln of ax, I might ask you, what's the derivative of that function? Well, according to what we just wrote on the line above, it should be the derivative of ax over ax itself. Well, the derivative of ax with respect to x is a, so it would be a over ax, which is actually just 1 over x. Okay, notice something. From the line above, or the two lines above, I know that's also the derivative of ln of x. So what we have here is the derivative of ln of x is 1 over x, and in general, the derivative of the ln of a multiple of x is also 1 over x. Okay, what does it mean, or what can you conclude when you say the derivative of one function is 1 over x, and the derivative of a different function is also that same 1 over x? Well, the thing you should be able to conclude from Calc 1 is that these two functions must be the same function except possibly for an additive constant, or the way you might have said it in Calc 1, those two functions can differ by at most a constant. Okay, so that means one of those has to be the other one plus some constant, which is the same thing as saying these two functions differ by a constant of some kind. Okay, now if you remember situations like this in Calc 1, once I had a relation between two functions where they differed by a constant, the next thing I would usually try to do is evaluate this equation at some special value of x to try and figure out what that c is. And oftentimes we would end up using x equals 0. Uh, the only problem here is I can't do ln of 0. With the way I've defined this function, 0 is not in the domain, so that's not going to work. Um, however, if you think about it for a minute, you might realize that x equals 1 would be a really good choice. Um, why? Well, because when I take ln of 1 right there on that first term on the right, I'm going to get 0. So when I substitute x equals 1 in this equation, I get ln of a equals ln of 1, which is actually just 0, which means ln of a is equal to c. What that says from this line is that ln of ax equals ln of x plus ln of a. Now, if we let x equal b, a particular value of b, that just says that ln of AB equals ln of B plus ln of A, which is our product rule that we are trying to prove. So notice the method of proof here is to take the derivative of this function, match it up against another derivative. You end up getting the same derivative, which means those two functions differ by some constant. And I'll just say that both of these other two properties can be proved in a similar way, and you should run through those yourself sometime. Um, before we go any further, though, uh, let's make one comment here. Why 
have I insisted here that r be a rational number? Because that certainly wasn't a condition on this rule in college algebra. In college algebra, when you had the ln of x to any number, even an irrational one, like square root of 2, you could still say that was square root of 2 times ln of x. Okay, the reason for that goes back to something we talked about in Calc 1. If you recall, in Calc 1, when we first proved the power rule, the basic power rule for derivatives, that is the derivative of x to the n equals nx to the n minus 1, you might remember that first we proved it for n is a positive integer. So that is 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. Then we figured out, once we learned the quotient rule, how to do it for n is a negative integer. So like negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, and so on. And then once we learned implicit differentiation, we could then prove it for n is an irrational number. But if you do recall at that point in Calc 1, what we said was we're going to extend this rule to all exponents, not just positive integer powers, negative integer powers, or rational powers in general. We would extend it to any powers at all, even irrational ones. So in Calc 1, once we made that assumption that that was OK, uh, we didn't have any problem with saying the derivative of x to the square root of 3 was square root of 3 times x to the square root of 3 minus 1. But we never really did prove that. We just uh, said it works, and we need it for right now, so we're just going to accept it. Uh, we'll be able to prove that in the next section. But right now, that's why we have this restriction on this power rule property that r needs to be a rational number. It's because when you go to prove number 3, you're going to take derivatives, like we just did to prove number 1. And really, the only thing I know for sure right now is the power rule for rational exponents. Okay, now that we've recalled those properties and we've seen that we can even prove that they're true based on this new definition, Let's talk about the characteristics of the graph of y equals ln of x. First of all, we know the derivative of ln of x now is 1 over x. Notice that since 1 over x is positive for positive x, y equals ln of x is an increasing function. That's just our first derivative criterion for whether a function is increasing or decreasing. The derivative is positive for all x in the domain. Uh, we could also ask what the second derivative is. And of course, the second derivative of this natural log function would be the first derivative of 1 over x, which is negative 1 over x squared, which is certainly negative for all x in the domain. OK, what does the second derivative tell you about the graph of a function? It tells you the concavity. In this case, it says that y equals ln of x is concave down everywhere on its domain. Number three, another point we can make, well, we already know this one, x equals 1 is the only 0 or x-intercept of this graph. Uh, since ln of x as a derivative, that is, since it's differentiable, 
we know ln of x is continuous. So putting this all together now, we have an increasing function that's concave down. We have an x-intercept of 1. And we have a function that is differentiable and therefore continuous. So, so far, everything is lining up for us to get this same graph that we had back in Calc 1. Definitely has the right shape in terms of its concavity and whether it's increasing or decreasing. It's got the right x-intercept. So the only other question is what? Um, is the limit as x approaches infinity of this function really infinity? And is the limit as x approaches 0 from the right of this function negative infinity? Which, of course, is the part that tells me there's a vertical asymptote at x equals 0. So question mark on those. And, of course, there is one last thing. If those two are true, we know that since this graph fills in all the values between negative infinity and positive infinity, um, the range of this function is supposed to be all real numbers. All right, so let's establish this last part, and then we've got our familiar log graph back again. So note if I look at our graph of 1 over t again, let's say where this is 1. And let's say this is 2. Then, of course, I know that when I shade in everything between 1 and 2 under the 1 over t curve, that's ln of 2 that we're looking at, that area. Okay, so you agree if I... That color is too light. Let's try purple. If I make a rectangle like this, that is a circumscribed rectangle where the function value that creates the top of that rectangle is x equals 1, then the area of that purple rectangle would be 1. Notice if I make this rectangle where the top of the rectangle, or the rectangle has a height of one half, because I'm using x equals two, plugging it into the one over t function and getting a y value of one half, the area of that rectangle would be one half. So the area of the red one is one half. The area underneath the purple constant function, y equals one, is one. Obviously, the area under the curve, which is the green shaded area, is between those two. It's smaller than the area of the purple rectangle. It's larger than the area of the red rectangle. So what that tells me is that the ln of 2 has to be larger than 1 half, but less than 1. In fact, if I really wanted to know at this point what the ln of 2 was based on the definition we've got so far, um, couldn't we actually use something like Simpson's rule or the trapezoidal rule to approximate the area under this curve between 1 and 2? If you did that, you would find that ln of 2 is about 0.69. So it definitely falls between my upper and lower limits here I'm getting with those two rectangles. Okay, so the important part I want to take from that is that the ln of 2 is larger than 1 half. That's the estimate I want to use. So let's suppose x is greater than 2 to the 2n, and you'll see why I'm choosing this here in a minute. 
this is where n is some positive integer. So suppose x is some real x value larger than 2 to some even integer, 2 times some n. Okay, that definitely implies that the ln of x is greater than the ln of 2 to the 2n. So this is the same thing we kept doing in the, in the last video. If I know the ln function is increasing, then that means the ln of a larger x value must be larger than the ln of a smaller number. So x is the smaller one, 2 to the 2n is the bigger one. When I apply the natural log function, which is increasing to those two values, that order is preserved. ln of x is larger than ln of 2 to the 2n. Since 2n is an integer, I should be able to use my power property to say that ln of x is larger than 2 to the 2n, I'm sorry, 2n times ln 2. And again, what I'm doing there is just using our power property, which allows me to pull that exponent down in front of the log. And when I do that, it becomes a multiplier. Okay, what did we just say up here? We have an estimate on how large ln of 2 is. It's greater than 1 half. Okay, so that means this is larger than 2n times 1 half, which of course would just be 1. So put that all together, and it says if x is greater than 2 to the 2n, then ln of x is greater than n. So let's put it this way. If you're given n greater than 0, then if we choose any x value larger than 2 to the 2n, then the ln of x is larger than n. Okay, that should look familiar to you. That sounds like the definition of limit as x approaches infinity of a function equals infinity. And by infinities there, I mean positive infinity. What is the definition for this statement? It's that if I'm given n greater than 0, there is some, let's say, m greater than 0, such that if we choose an any x value larger than that m value, then f of x will be larger than any given n value that you provide me. So, of course, picture-wise, we're just saying if the limit of a function is really infinity, it means if you pick any y value, like, say, an n, then there should be some m value such that if you pick any x value larger than that m, you're going to get y values that are larger than the n value. And of course, if I make that n bigger, it just means the m has to be bigger. But that's the nature of saying the limit is positive infinity. You can make the y value get as big as you want, but just by insisting that the x value is sufficiently large. Okay, in this derivation I just did, we're saying what? That we can make our function larger than any integer you give me, any positive integer you give me, as long as you make x sufficiently large. How large? At least as big as 2 to the 2n. So what we've proven here is that the limit as x approaches positive infinity of the natural log function is positive infinity. Similarly, if we look at the limit as x approaches 0 from the right, so if I approach that lower bound of the domain, 
from the right. I could write that as limit as x approaches 0 from the right of the ln of 1 over x to the negative 1. And again, since I'm taking the log of something to an integer power, my power property says that I can pull that negative 1 down in front of the log where it becomes a multiplier. Once I do that, I should be able to just pull it right outside the limit and get negative limit x approaches 0 from the right of the ln of 1 over x. Notice that as x approaches 0 from the right, 1 over x approaches infinity. We know that when the argument of the log function approaches infinity, that the log function also approaches infinity. That's what we just proved on the last page. So when x approaches 0 from the right, 1 over x approaches infinity. When 1 over x approaches infinity, ln of 1 over x also approaches infinity. That means this part should be positive infinity. But there is a negative in front of that now, which means our limit is negative infinity. The limit as x approaches 0 from the right of the natural log function is negative infinity. OK, so what do we know now? We know that we have this function that has an x-intercept at 1. When x approaches infinity, the function approaches infinity. When x approaches 0 from the right, the y values approach negative infinity, which means there's a vertical asymptote at x equals 0. We know that in between there, the graph is increasing and concave down. So there's one last question. Am I guaranteed that every single y value in between positive infinity and negative infinity is covered? That is, is the range of this function really all real numbers? And if you think about it, the answer you should come up with is yes, because we said this function is continuous. And the intermediate value theorem would guarantee that if I pick any intermediate value in between, say, positive infinity and negative infinity, if you don't like using infinities and you'd rather use numbers, then just pick two values like 1,000 and negative 1,000. If I pick any m between those two values, the intermediate value theorem will guarantee that there is some c that gives me ln of c equals that m. And since I can make these numbers as far away from 0 as I want, I can determine a c for any m that you give me, no matter how far from 0 it is. That establishes that the range of this function is all real numbers. So again, just a quick summary. The domain of the log function, and these are the, the big important facts to know, is 0 to infinity. The range is all real numbers. 1, 0 is the x-intercept. ln of x is increasing on its domain. ln of x is concave down on its domain. And most importantly, the derivative of ln of x is 1 over x. And I think that's what we've established so far based on this definition. OK, so now we're at the point where we can start introducing some calculus. Uh, we've already determined the basic formula for the derivative. So let's look at some uh, applications of that formula to various situations. First of all, let's put this next example under the heading of using, let's say, log properties to 
to make, oops, to make derivatives easier. So for example, if I had something like y equals, and let's just make some outrageous combination of functions like the cube root of 2x plus 5 over, let's say, 4x plus 1 to the fifth times sine of 3x. If I asked you to find the derivative of that function, well, you can do it. Um, there's a big quotient rule there. Inside that quotient rule, there's going to be a product rule I'd have to do. Um, when I take the derivatives of individual parts inside this quotient rule and, and product rule, there will be little chain rules going on all over the place. There's obviously going to be chain rule there. There's going to be a chain rule for this one and another chain rule for this one. So we know how to do that. And after we grind through it a minute or two, we would come up with the formula. And of course, I, I might need to simplify it, which would mean condensing all that. That could be a lot of work. So let's suppose here for a minute that instead of just taking the derivative of this function directly, I took the natural log of both sides of this equation. Okay, so instead of taking the derivative directly by doing that big quotient rule with the product rule embedded in it, let's just simply take the natural log of both sides of this equation. Now, if I ask you to take the derivative of both sides of this equation, the first question is, what does that left side look like? Well, remember a little while ago, we said the derivative of the ln of u, where u is a function of x, was u prime over u. So in this case, the derivative with respect to x of ln of y should just be y prime over y. Okay, so derivative of ln of y is y prime over y. Now, when you look at the right side, and this, uh, this will get us back to this part where I said uh, using log properties to make derivatives easier. What, what do you think about when you look at that right side of the equation? Well, if you're thinking back to your college algebra days, you should be thinking about expanding or condensing logarithms by using those properties. Okay, which one would I want to do here? It would be expanding. If I could expand this logarithm into a combination of simpler logarithms, it might be easier to take derivatives on those simpler pieces than to try and take the derivative on that big thing all at once. Okay, so think about what that right side looks like. Since there is a big quotient here, I could use that quotient property, which says the ln of cube root of 2x plus 5 divided by this stuff in the bottom should be the ln of that numerator minus the ln of that denominator. And of course, we're going to take the derivative of all that. But right now, I'm not taking the derivative yet. I just want to see if I can simplify that log on the right side a little bit. Okay, what else can you do? Well, there's lots there. We know the log of cube root of 2x plus 5 is really just the ln of 2x plus 5 to the 1 third. And I could definitely use my power rule to pull that one-third down in front of the log. And so that first part becomes one-third ln of 2x plus 5. 
Okay, what about the second part? Well, the second part is minus the ln of a product, and we know we have the product rule for that. That is, the ln of a product is the sum of the natural logs of those two factors in that product. Uh, just be careful here. Notice that that subtraction will have to distribute to both of those terms that you expand. So that means I should get minus, and check me if this is right, minus 5 ln 4x plus 1 minus ln sine 3x. And again, we're still taking the derivative there. Take a second, confirm that. Okay, now, is it going to be pretty easy to take the derivatives of these three parts term by term? I think so. What's the derivative of that first one? Well, it's going to be one-third times the derivative of the ln of 2x plus 5. Okay, what's our rule? When we take the derivative of ln u, we get u prime over u. Okay, in this case the u is 2x plus 5, and the numerator should be the derivative of 2x plus 5, which is 2. Minus, okay, same thing for this next one. What's the derivative there? Well, the derivative of ln of 4x plus 1 should be the derivative of 4x plus 1, which is 4, over 4x plus 1. What's that last one? It should be the derivative of sine 3x, which is 3 cosine 3x, over sine 3x. Okay, so what do I have here? I have y prime over y equals, looks like I'll just say 2 over 3 times 2x plus 5 minus 20 over 4x plus 1. I could call this last one 3 times the cotangent of 3x. Okay, we are trying to find the derivative. So what do I need to do to find the derivative? I just need to solve for y prime which just means multiplying both sides of this equation by y. In which case I'm going to get y prime is 2 over 3 times 2x plus 5 minus 20 over 4x plus 1 minus 3 cotangent 3x times y, which is just my original function of cube root 2x plus 5 over 4x plus 1 to the fifth times sine 3x. Um, oftentimes when you take a derivative using this sort of technique, uh, what you're going to get is not going to be in a very friendly form. Sometimes there's simplification to do, sometimes there isn't. Um, if you were checking the answer on one like this in the back of the book, you would at least probably see them combining these terms by getting a common denominator. And that's probably about as far as it would go because once you do that, there's probably not much in this fraction, this single fraction you get out of putting those three together, that's really going to simplify with much over here from the y itself. So I've gone through this example in detail just to show you this technique. And this technique that we just used here is what we would call logarithmic differentiation. And so just to point out here explicitly, what is the technique of logarithmic differentiation? And we are going to come back and use this technique a bunch in a, in a future section. But basically the idea is to take a function 
which might otherwise be difficult to take a derivative on, write it in this functional equation form, y equals f of x. Take the ln of both sides. Take the derivative of both sides, and of course, symbolically on the left, that means y prime over y. Notice on the other side, it really will be f prime of x over f of x. And so then what is y prime? Well, it would be f prime of x over f of x times y. Uh, and that may look like uh, gibberish to you because what you might be saying to yourself is, well, doesn't that just give me f prime? Well, of course it does. This equation right here just says y prime is equal to f prime, which of course that's true. Just realize that when you use this technique, these two things right here aren't always going to look exactly the same. So it's not like once you multiply both sides by y, you're going to see these two guys uh, sitting right there where they can be canceled like this. This f of x, oops, this f of x right here is going to be mixed together in whatever you get when you take the derivative of that right side of the equation. You're not going to explicitly see the original function in the denominator like that, which means when you multiply both sides by y, these two things are not going to cancel in some easily recognizable way. Okay, so logarithmic differentiation is a very important technique. And as you'll see later, uh, even though in this example that we just did, we could have taken the derivative another way using quotient rules and product rules, um, there are functions we're going to see later where logarithmic differentiation is the only way to take the derivative. So there's quite a bit of practice in your homework using this technique. So you need to get used to that where it becomes second nature. Uh, be careful. Don't make the sort of mistake that's often made in college algebra. Um, if I said, let's, let's suppose I had y equals uh, 3x plus 2 to the fifth plus 7x minus 8 to the one-third. Now, first of all, there's no reason that I would want to use logarithmic differentiation on this problem. I already have two pretty simple terms on the right that I can apply chain rules to. But suppose I did take the log of both sides, because for some reason I thought logarithmic differentiation was the thing to do here. So when I take the log on the right side, I would have the natural log of 3x plus 2 to the fifth plus 7x minus 8 to the one-third. And so now, if I take the derivative of both sides, well, of course, the derivative on the left side is going to be y prime over y. Uh, be careful. What are you going to do now when you go to try and take the derivative on this right side? Well, you don't want to split this back into ln of 3x plus 2 to the fifth plus ln of 7x minus 8 to the one-third because what I have shaded in orange there is not equal to that. Our rule doesn't say that the ln of a plus b is equal to ln of a plus ln of b. It says the ln of a times b is equal to ln of a plus ln of b. Okay, the problem here is I don't really want to take a log of a sum because that doesn't really help me later on. The log of a sum doesn't simplify in any nice way. Actually, at this point, if you really wanted the problem this way, what you'd have to do now when you take the derivative of that right side is do 1 over 3x plus 2 to the fifth plus 7x minus 8 to the one-third times the derivative of that same thing, which would be 5 times 3x plus 2 to the fourth times the derivative of the inside, which is 3, 
plus one third times seven x minus eight to the one third minus one, which would be minus two thirds times seven. Okay, is that the same thing as, well, of course, one other thing here, I would also still have to multiply by y, if you notice. So let me do that here. y prime would be equal to all of this stuff on the right. Let me just say um, this times y, which is 3x plus 2 to the fifth plus 7x minus 8 to the one third. And you can see that that is contained in the denominator of this which means these two are going to cancel, that is, these two. And what you're going to end up with in the end is just this. Well, that's what I would have gotten if I'd just taken the derivative of this directly. The point of this example is don't use log properties when they're not really called for. Trying to apply a log to a sum doesn't really make sense because none of my properties can be exploited to make that anything simpler. In fact, I've just made it worse. I've added a lot of extra complication. So I guess the point here is when you think about the form of those properties, ln of a product, ln of a quotient, ln of a power, when you use logarithmic differentiation, you're trying to simplify expressions that involve products or quotients or powers, not sums or differences. So keep that in mind when you're trying to use this technique. Okay, that brings us to integration. Well, we know that if u is a positive number, then the antiderivative of 1 over u with respect to u should be ln of u. Uh, that's simply because the derivative with respect to x of ln of u is 1 over u, u prime. Or if I just did it in terms of u, d du of ln of u is 1 over u. So if I just back up the derivative formula I already know, I know that the antiderivative of 1 over u is ln of u. Uh, notice here, though, that's only true if u is greater than 0, because the log function has a domain, and our derivative formula is based on obeying that domain. All right, so the question is, is, a is it a legitimate question to ask about what the antiderivative of 1 over u is when u is less than 0? Well, the thing you may be thinking is, well, it's ln of u, but that doesn't make any sense because u isn't defined when u is, or ln of u isn't defined when u is negative. Okay, that's true, but 1 over u is defined when u is negative. If you think about the graph of 1 over x, it looks like that. And 1 over x is definitely for defined for negative values. So 1 over u does have an antiderivative if u is less than 0. Um, think of it this way. Where might I be going with this if I was trying to figure out what the antiderivative was? Well. I might want to be trying to figure out how to find areas under curves. And what we've established so far is if I'm going to integrate from, say, 1 to 2, 1 over t dt, which is 1 to 2, which is that area under that 1 over 2 curve, that's the thing we're calling ln of 2. But could I ask you the same question? except where my interval of integration contains a bunch of negative numbers. For example, could I integrate from negative 2 to negative 1, 1 over t 
t dt. Well, again, what does 1 over t look like? When t is negative, it's over here. And if that was negative 2 and that was negative 1, the integral from negative 2 to negative 1 of 1 over t would be that area. Do you agree that that should be the same as this area, only this integral value should be negative because my graph is below the curve when my interval of integration ranges over a set of negative values. In fact, you should be able to see that the answer to this bottom integral is just going to be the negative of what I got when I integrated from 1 to 2. All right, so let's go back to our question up here. Can I come up with a generic formula for what the antiderivative of 1 over u is when u is negative? Well, let's do a simple little trick, which is let's change that u to a negative u, and let's change that du to a negative du. And notice what I'm really doing there is just taking top and bottom in this integrand and just multiplying by 1 in the form of negative 1 over negative 1. Let's do a little substitution. Let's let w equal negative u, which means dw equals negative du. Okay, if I do that, notice that what we have now is integral 1 over w because negative u is w times dw because negative du is dw. Notice now also with the way I've defined this, if u is negative, negative u is positive. And since w is negative u, that means the w in this integral is positive. And I know that if this variable is positive, when I integrate 1 over that variable with respect to that variable, I get ln of w. Okay, but what was w? It was negative u. Okay, let's put these two statements together now. And I think what we've got is the following. We've got that the ln of, oops, we've got that the integral of 1 over u du is equal to one of two things. It's equal to ln of u plus c if u is positive it's equal to the ln of negative u plus c if u is negative. Okay, now of course if u is negative, this part right here is actually positive. Okay, what's the way I could condense both of these cases into one statement? Well, the simple way to do that would be to say ln of absolute value of u plus c. That would guarantee in both cases that I, the argument of my log function is positive. In the case of u being positive, absolute value of u would just be u. And in the case of u being negative, absolute value of u would be negative u. So our final formula that we're going to write, and this is how we're always going to write the answer for integrals involving 1 over u, the integral of 1 over u du is always going to be the ln of the absolute value of u plus c. Now I could certainly leave off the absolute value if I knew that the u was positive. But if that's unknown, and usually I don't know what u is in a generic formula, I'm going to have to use absolute values in my answer, always. Okay, so using that basic formula, let's do a couple of examples just to see how this works. 
So here's a pretty basic one. Integral of x squared over x cubed plus 1 dx. All right, now, uh, as you're going to see in this class, uh, a large part of what we do the first half of this semester or this term is to learn new integration techniques. So what you're going to do is add to the techniques you already know from Calc 1. You don't really have a lot of techniques from Calc 1. You know the power rule, and you know the antiderivatives of sine and cosine, and you learned a few substitution techniques or how to build integrals that exploit the chain rule, but it was fairly limited what you could do. If you think back to what you learned in Calc 1, you should realize that this is not one that I can handle uh, using anything I know so far. But the one thing that does jump out at me, or should jump out at me, is the degree of the top is one less than the degree of the bottom. And if I realize that the bottom is a polynomial, and it's third degree, then I know if I take the derivative of that, I'll get a second degree, which is what I see in the top. Okay, that's my clue that I might want to try the substitution that lets u be the denominator. Because if I do that, I know the du will be one degree less. In fact, if this guy is a u, it looks like the only thing I need to add in the top to make a du is just a 3, which means I'll balance that on the outside with a 1 -third. And when I do that, what I get is the integral 1 -third integral du over u. Okay, and using our formula, that should just be one-third ln of absolute value of u, which is one-third ln of, make sure you resubstitute what the u is. So x cubed plus one plus c. Okay, let's try a slightly different example. Another rational function. Okay, notice the difference now is that the degree in the top, the degree of the numerator is larger than the degree of the denominator. Okay, so as I'm checking off items in my, my list that I'm looking for, looking through to try and match patterns, uh, it wouldn't make sense to let u equal the bottom if my goal was to try and find a du in that numerator because the numerator power is bigger. Now there actually is a way to use that substitution that we'll talk about in a minute, but if I'm just trying to think about this general pattern where the u in the bottom should have a larger power if it's polynomial, so that the du in the top has a power that's one smaller, this, this pattern doesn't seem to match. Okay, but um, now is when I think back to college algebra, and I realize that any time I see a rational function where the degree of the top is greater than or equal to the degree of the bottom, the denominator, the first thing I might think of doing is long division. And we are going to need to do long division for a lot of different things in this class, so uh, get used to doing long division again. We're going to need it to do integration and also some, some things in chapter 8. So in this case, if I long divide x plus 1 into x squared plus 2, um, x goes into x squared x times x times x is x squared, x times 1 is x. I subtract to get my remainder. When I do that, I'll get minus x plus 2. When I divide x into negative x, I get negative 1. When I multiply negative 1 times x plus 1, I get negative x minus 1. 
when I subtract, I get a remainder of 3. Okay, so what that says is x squared plus 2 over x plus 1 is equal to the quotient x minus 1 plus the remainder 3 over the divisor x plus 1. Meaning the integral of x squared plus 2 over x plus 1 is just the integral of x minus 1 plus 3 over x plus 1. Uh, that's a pretty easy antiderivative for the first two terms. And then this last one, this third term, I recognize that that's one of my log antiderivatives now. That should be plus 3 ln x plus 1. All right, now, I mentioned that there is a way you can do this by letting u equal that denominator. So that is, if I just went straight to that denominator and I was trying to shoot for a 1 over du by letting that be u, there is a way to actually make that work. Um, and you saw some stuff like this in Calc 1. Using that substitution u equals x1, I definitely get that x is u minus 1, which means x squared is u minus 1 squared. And that means that x squared plus 2 is u minus 1 squared plus 2, which is u squared minus 2u plus 1 plus 2, which is plus 3. Okay, so that means if I look at my integral up here, that x squared plus 2 is now u squared minus 2u plus 3. The x plus 1 is u. And then what's the dx? Well, if u is x plus 1, then du is just dx. So when you put that all together, what do you get? you get u squared minus 2u plus 3 over u du. Uh, notice what that is. That's just u minus 2 plus 3 over u du. Uh, what is that? It's u squared over 2 minus 2u plus 3 ln u. Okay, what did we say u was? Going back to our substitution, we said that u was x plus 1. So if I resubstitute that, I'll have x plus 1 squared over 2 minus 2 times x plus 1 plus 3 times ln of absolute value of x plus 1 plus c. Okay, I'll leave this for you to verify, but if you expand all that and collect like terms, you're going to get the same answer you got using the other, other technique. The only thing that could be different when you use these two different approaches is there may be other constant terms when you use one method that you don't see in the other method, but those constant terms would be absorbed into that additive constant. They would be... Uh, be they would become a part of the C. So I, I'm sure you'll have questions when we talk about your homework for this section. Uh, many of them will be very obvious what substitution you should use, but I guess the best advice I can give you right now is if you see a fraction, uh, your thought should be is it possible that the bottom could be a u? And if it is a u, can I use what's in the numerator to build the du? And that's the kind of game I'm going to play if I'm going to try and turn this into a 1 over u du integral. Now let's do a couple of last examples here, and these are important. 
and let's start out with this one, the integral of tangent, which you'll recall we, we didn't actually do in Calc 1. In fact, for all that we did in Calc 1, what are the only two trig antiderivatives we know? Sine and cosine. We don't know the antiderivatives of tangent, cotangent, secant, or cosecant. Okay, let's look at tangent. And when you see how I get the antiderivative for tangent, you should be able to see right away how we would get the antiderivative for cotangent. I'll write tangent in a typical way. I'll write it using that identity that says tangent is sine over cosine. Uh, again, notice I have a clear fraction with a denominator, and the first thing that should be jumping to the four there is that this top this numerator is almost the derivative of the denominator. Actually, the only thing that's missing is a negative. And if I did that and let u equal the denominator, then du would be that numerator that I have now that I've inserted that negative. So that means tangent of x dx is the same thing as negative integral du over u. That's where u is cosine x. Okay, what's that? It should be negative ln absolute value of u plus c. But what was u again? u was, oops, u was cosine x. So this should be negative ln absolute value cosine x plus c. Um, there are other ways to write that answer. Uh, because of trig identities, you can rewrite this in several different ways. For example, um, I could call this negative ln of 1 over secant x. Sorry, that's not what I meant to say. What I meant to say was negative ln of 1 over secant to the negative 1, since the reciprocal of secant is cosine. And then if I put this negative back up in the exponent using my power property for logs, I would get ln of 1 over secant. OK, that's another way to write this answer. Point being, when you look at answers for some of these antiderivatives that involve trig functions, you remember seeing this in Calc 1, oftentimes the answers can be written in different ways. Your answer might not always match the answer you see in the book exactly. Um, it might be just a matter of rewriting it using trig identities, or they might be different by a constant, which means they're both legitimate general antiderivatives. In this case, the one I've written here is the standard formula. It's the one, uh, if you were going to remember this as a formula, it's the one I would remember. Integral of tangent is negative ln of cosine, absolute value. Do you see how we would get the formula for cotangent then? If the u was sine x, then du would be cosine x dx, which means in this case, I don't even need to insert the negative. I already have a 1 over u du, where u is sine x. That's the formula for the antiderivative of cotangent. OK, we have two more to look at. And we can also handle those now. We can definitely come up with a formula for antiderivative of secant and antiderivative of cosecant. All right, this one's a little obtuse. Uh, you, you wouldn't really, most students, even pretty good ones, would probably not come up with this trick. Uh, of course, once you see the trick, it makes perfect sense. What I'm going to do is treat secant x as secant x over 1, and I'm going to multiply that fraction by secant x 
plus tangent x over itself. So I'm just doing the old uh, multiply by 1 trick. Notice if I do that, I get secant squared x plus secant x tangent x in the numerator. In the denominator, I just get secant x plus tangent x. Take a look at that for just a minute. And if you know your derivatives well for your trig functions, um, the pattern should jump right out at you. What's the derivative of tangent? It's secant squared. What's the derivative of secant? It's secant of x times tangent of x. In other words, if u was that denominator, secant x plus tangent x, then du would be precisely secant x tangent x plus secant squared x dx, which is precisely what I have in this numerator. That is a du if I choose this denominator as the u, which means we're back to du over u again, which means our antiderivative should be ln of u, absolute value, which means the typical formula you're going to see for antiderivative of secant is ln of absolute value of secant x plus tangent x. Now I'll tell you what, I'll leave the last one for you. In fact, I won't write the formula here. It's, it's all over your section. But let's see if you can try it for yourself and, and try it before you look at the answer in the back. But the last one would be, what's the antiderivative of cosecant x? And I'll just give you one hint. If you think about the trick I used up here, where I multiplied by this secant x plus tangent x over itself, you notice, of course, that the functions I used were secant and tangent because those are the two functions that are involved in derivatives of secants. Okay, what are the two functions that are involved in the derivative of cosecant? Well, it's cosecant and cotangent, except if you recall, there are some negatives in there somewhere in those derivative formulas. So let's see if you can figure out what the correct multiplication factor is. And I'll just give you one last hint. It's not just cosecant plus cotangent. There's got to be a, at least one negative in there somewhere. So see if you can figure that out and come up with that last formula. And once you have that, that means from this point forward, we actually have the antiderivatives of all six trig functions. Okay, and I think that's a good place to stop. That finishes out 6.2. Uh, let me know if you have any questions.